What's going on, guys? Gotta always start off with that. This is the Gains Podcast, episode 15, coming at you live with your main mans. Roman. And Antoine. It won't be live live when they have you. (laughs) I know, but coming at you live, like, at this moment. That's that's true. Like, this is, (laughs) you know, I'm not recording, and then Roman's recording. We're editing, putting two to two together, and Photoshopping this in. (laughs) That's what I meant by that. Uh, take that with a grain of salt. Maybe eventually we could do that. Yeah. That'd be cool. Maybe do a Q and A live. Yeah. Um, but first we have to have an audience. <laughs> um, so hopefully you guys are sharing and giving this a like and everything, so we can definitely get this um, movement across the world. Um, hopefully across the world eventually. We're just trying to make it out of Illinois and uh, Massachusetts right now. <laughs> um, thank you, guys. We love you guys. We thank you for uh, always watching and tuning in to those loyal supporters uh, that are pretty much close by to Roman and I, pretty, <laughs> right? Wouldn't you say? Uh, if you didn't know, I know I mentioned in the last one, we just started off uh, the Gains Podcast Instagram as well as the Short Gains series. Short Gains series. We're on episode two of that. Episode three should be coming out before this video, before this podcast. I guess I'll have to, I'll have to do it now since we usually release within like five days of producing. So um, we'll have to put that on me since it'll be my turn putting short gains out. Um, also, um, quick note before we start: uh, this vi- uh, podcast is going to be about stretching in the warm up. Um, with resistance training or any training, well, power and strength uh, and endurance training. Um, just want to give, uh, you know, a, you know, some prayers and love to the Kobe Bryant's family as well as uh, the baseball coach from UCC um, from the crash that happened on the 26th. Um, if you guys didn't know, um, if you're just knowing me now, growing up, growing up in Illinois, I've always been – uh, a Lakers and Bulls fan, Kobe Bryant especially, because I used to play basketball as a kid. Um, and if it wasn't for him, lifting in the mentality of that mindset uh, wouldn't be there. Doing this episode is kind of hard because it's the day after, but uh, knowing him and his successfulness within life and his love for the game, um, he probably wouldn't any- want anyone to stop. So I'm going to use that and push myself through this time of grieving as well as uh, moving forward. So great episode today. Um, and it's because this is probably one of the most important things on starting lifting as well as maintaining lifting with flexibility and warming up before training. So we're going to first go over the types of stretching uh, by definition. And then we'll probably go over Uh, what we do currently when it comes to stretching, how we use best practices. Um, Because just because these definitions say something doesn't mean we always have to believe fully like everything else. Obviously, you guys probably know that already. Um, So we're going to start off with self-myofascial release, SMR. Well, yeah, um, yeah, as I say, Roman's going to start this one off. So The most common um, method you'll usually hear um, or tool you'll usually hear um, using SMR or self-application release or um, I I read a paper this morning actually um, that just called it fascial release. So you'll hear anything along those lines are foam rollers. And MR too, you said, right? Or or just myofascial release, MR. Um, It could definitely be abbreviated that. Um, So you might have gone into a gym and seen these... Um, these like dark objects about like this size in um, in diameter or rather circumference and anywhere between like a foot, two feet, three feet, maybe even a little bit longer. Um, so what many people use them and typically they're made of some type of a foam. Um, people will use them to, I think originally the concept was that you were breaking up scar tissue in the muscle. Muscle spindles, and, yeah. And um, you're allowing like this like fascial gliding. Um, the basic concept is uh, like on the surface level, you'll get some like you get some conductive heat that's going on between uh, your your like your skin and and like the muscles themselves, and 
um, just like the rubbing of the, the foam roller over, let's say like your hamstrings. So let's say you're like you're rolling out your hamstrings, trying to warm them up. And typically you'll you want to go from the the start of the muscle itself or as close as you can get to it because the hamstrings attach like pretty high all the way to their other attachment point. So um, a typical strategy would be to see people um, with the foam roller and rolling over their hamstrings and what's going on is you're getting um, a warming up of the tissue itself so the muscle the skin um, that surrounds the tissue the the different like layers of fascia which are like the connective tissue to the the muscles themselves and that causes uh, to a certain degree a um, so it has a warm effect and then it also has the effect of increasing range of motion and um, the benefit of increasing range of motion is especially for a movement like let's say like an RDL or a hamstring curl uh, if you have a reduced range of motion that means that you can only bring um, muscle fibers through a uh, reduced range of motion, meaning that you have a reduced load on the muscle over the entire uh, length of the muscle. And you're effectively what ends up happening is for the most part, you have reduced gains by doing that. It's just like an easy way to look at it. So um, like a good way to test this, I wouldn't really do it myself, but you can do like bicep curls only up to like this point here which is about then, half for the listeners so like half range halfway. of motion when he's curling and so. um so you could do that with one arm your left arm for example and the right arm you could go through a full range of motion you'll find that the arm that goes through the full range of motion let's say the right arm versus the left arm the right arm is going to grow more and it will also become stronger through all ranges of motion so that's why for all movements that you can um, perform full range. safely. Yeah. Uh, it's best to practice with a full range of motion because that's gonna, one, give you the maximum gains and also give you the greatest strength through that full range of motion, which just like off the cuff, like makes the most sense. Um, there are some things that you'll see some seasoned bodybuilders do, which are still like very controversial, uh, yeah. such as like partial reps. Um, there may or may not be some sort of benefit to them. Um, there may or may not be like an increased injury risk involved. Um, that's much of that is over my scope, uh, over my head for like the scope when it comes to like the injury piece. I would just say that when it comes to uh, partials, uh, I've never been a huge fan of them. Um, if it's something that is like a like a specialty or an advanced technique that you use from time to time, probably not too bad. But if you're using it. Um, all over, the, all over the place, like once again, refer back to that test where you can test it on yourself for four, eight, 12 weeks, do partial range of motion on one arm for a bicep curl and do full range of motion on the other arm. And then you come, you report back to us, let us know what the hypertrophy gain is of your bicep and the strength level. I would be shocked if the, the left arm somehow got bigger and was stronger yeah. than, than the right arm. Two things on that is one, don't you do partial reps to, like, when you do bicep curls, you know, when you start halfway and go full range, don't, aren't you just working on the peak at that point? I mean, why, why wouldn't you suggest uh, partial reps? I mean, don't you want your biceps to, like, almost when you flex, almost touching your hand? So the peak is, um, that's a very interesting point. And my understanding of, like, the quote-unquote peak is that is 100% based off of genetic factors. Um, so Yeah, I, I was, as I said, I was going to go into that, but... <laughs> I like how he went like a little deeper in that. That's so funny. Um, no, but that's actually that's something that you'll hear people saying. Like people might be saying, like, suggesting that. Yeah, I'm working like on developing like the, the peak, peak of my bicep, and that might just be something that like you can never achieve, unfortunately. And it's not to say that like there's anything wrong with that. Your your individualized biomechanics are your individualized biomechanics. So you just might not have that shape to your muscle belly, whereas somebody might. And that could be deemed by like a judge, let's say, for example, if you're doing like a bodybuilding competition as more desirable. But typically what a judge is looking for when it comes to that are um, size and, um, oh God, why am I blanking on this? Uh, the overall relation of the size of other muscles yeah. as well. Uh, what do they call that? Um, yeah, whatever. We'll it's a sh- it's a folks. stretching it's a stretching episode. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and then two before I get on to the next one, I thought you used foam rolling like the rollers in the gym as a pillow. 
before your next set? Like, don't you like take a quick uh, nap? Yeah, yeah, so that's um, that's also a common um, common thing that you see in the gym. And um, contrary to common belief, uh, naps in between sets, you're maximizing them gains, folks. Yeah, resting <laughs> and then doing a set. Like, what more? More you're confusing your muscles. Um, the only other thing I want to add to is like. Uh, you can use other products besides like foam roller, like a lacrosse ball, um, like um, what I forgot there was like, I don't know, there's different things. There's like one that's actually built like for your spine that has like a little gap so you don't specifically roll on your spine um, because as you know, you probably shouldn't be doing a lot of impact to your spine because that's not a muscle. That's you know, that's something that you definitely don't want to mess with. So they make an actual, you can actually tape two lacrosse balls too as well. It'll give you a gap um, to get like the muscles in between your spine. Um, but to Roman's point, he was kind of alluding to earlier is uh, there's not yet enough research or enough enough evidence to prove like myofascial release actually works. Like I was just listening to a podcast, um, the Stronger by Science one with yeah. Eric Trexler and Gre- uh, Greg Knuckles. I almost like Greg Helms. Uh, that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> but that means they would have to have it. All right, never mind. They fused. Uh, yeah, they fused <laughs> together somehow. But, like, they said there was no evidence um, to know exactly if it's correct or not. So, yeah. But a lot of people do it because they... Yeah, certain aspects. Because I think yeah. what's pretty well documented in the literature is that um, self-myofacial release um, with a tool such as, like, a foam roller has, has the potential to increase range of motion. Yeah. Um, and I think it's because you're working stuff out that yeah. doesn't necessarily get hit when it's a resistance training or that range of motion. Um, so a couple of things if we're going to speculate. Yeah. Um, so what the literature might suggest, um, and there's like a fancy term for it yeah. um, in the paper that I read, but essentially what they were saying is that like the muscle responds to uh, local warming of the tissue uh, essentially so there's one theory that says like the way that muscles contract and uh, contract and like um, relax yeah. is based off of, like a, the sliding filament theory yeah so um, yeah the filament theory yep. yeah uh, so, i know what like, you're exactly you're talking about the the muscle fibers essentially like glide over each other yeah. i'll try not to do the the, mu- the that particular motion um sorry for the folks that are listening or um, watching the video yeah. <laughs> i should say you should say um, listening you're, you're safe <laughs> so they're there might be that. I think what's that's part of part of it. I think what also is happening is there's satellite cells on uh, muscle fibers, and I think that that type of motion, um, that type of like gliding. Um, so when you're doing it passively after like a workout, for example, as like yeah. a, like a cool down or part of like a test to see like oh like how's my range of motion coming along for um, my my knee flexion so that I can catch like a you know, a clean at the bottom, and I don't have to worry about, like, you know, buckling over type deal. Um, I believe that there's satellite cells on the outside of the muscle fibers that communicate to um, your brain, essentially, uh, because those are going to be, like, locations uh, where, like, nerves are, are, like, connected to, and they essentially communicate a certain degree of, like, relaxation to the muscle fiber yeah. um, that that allows for this like additional range of motion so I think that's also potentially part of the picture but that's yeah. that's mostly speculation from what I understand and I, I don't know if that's something that we could say is like definitely happening yeah yes point. or no right now yeah. yeah no and that's great this that's great to bring that on that information too as well um, so the next uh, piece that I wanted to get into was uh, static stretching yeah, I don't know what it is, but it's not, every time I look at the exercises or, like, think of it, I always think of, like, gym class, yeah. like, back in the day. Um, you probably went through this this uh, stretch, like, type of stretching in class where, you know, you would hold your foot to your butt, you know, to stretch out your quad. You would put your hands down with the most straight back as possible and leaning over to get a good stretch in the hamstrings. Um, so pretty much just stretching, think of like the ones where you're holding, you know, they say minimum 30 seconds, um, probably after that, that's up to like your disclosure. And it's same thing with like myofascial, like they always say at least 30 seconds 
is it the googly eye tendon? Uh, Golgi. Golgi. I always. Why do I always? I always mess. So there's that organ that is like the main responder within your muscle, and they say in the literature it's the 30 seconds, right? I think 30 seconds is like the general recommendation, but I think the Golgi tendon actually activates after seven seconds, and that's like the yeah. main benefit. Yeah. So that's the main benefit of like holding the stretch. Um, or, you know, if you want, like, try to do it as long as possible, I mean, it's not going to hurt you. Yeah. I mean, unless for some reason you're injured and you're holding it, that's probably a dumb idea. Yeah. Um, but the, like, the main definition is used to correct existing muscle imbalances and lengthen overactive and tight muscles. Um, so can be used before and after exercise, it says. But um, we'll talk about it a little bit after on what our thoughts on that, because I don't want to get too much in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then I'll simply leave it at that because I'm gonna say something too much, and we we want to keep it to the point until after. Yeah. Um, you want to go over the next? Yeah, uh, it's dynamic. You could. Um, do you want to go over active isolated, or do you want to go dynamic? I know oh, active nice. isolated was technically one, but it's. But di- I I feel like that and dynamic stretching is like almost the same. Yeah. Because. I would. Go over your definition, and I'll go over my definition, and we'll, we'll see. Uh. So active isolated stretching, um, pretty much the definition, increasing uh, motor neuron uh, excitability, creating reciprocal inhibition of the muscle being stretched by using agonists and synergists to dynamically move the joints into range of motion uh, to increase uh, ex- extensibility of soft tissues. So um, you can use this as a preactive warm-up, but only by, by oh, by the way, when I'm speaking, it's NASM. I think you already said where yes, you're speaking. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I just never mentioned it. I'm speaking more NASM terminology, um, so it might differ a little bit, but almost the same. So it's the National Association of Sports Medicine? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then NSCA uh, is National Strength and Conditioning Association, uh, two very reputable um, organizations within um, the, like, personal training yeah. and... Um, Probably like one, the, one of the two best. The fitness yeah. space, yeah. yeah. So, and then um, as you would go about these movements and whatnot for active isolated, um, it does suggest, which makes sense, um, if you see imbalances, don't do this until you've done SMR um, or static stretching to s- like move through that imbalance and try to fix it first, um, which we wouldn't even suggest working out until that is as well, yeah. or at least doing a specific movement. To um, a certain degree, too, um, yeah. because I believe um, it's, like, well documented that, like, Usain Bolt, for example, has one leg that's significantly shorter than the other, like, by, like, an inch and a half or something along those and lines. That, yeah, that's genetic. So, you can't really fix that. Exactly. So yeah. um, there, there was a very interesting podcast that was put out this weekend, Friday. Um, it was like an injury roundtable with um, oh, the Barbell yeah, Medicine yeah. crew, <laughs> as well as um, RP Dr. Mike, <coughs> Greg Knuckles, Eric Trexler, and Omar Esau. Michael um, something and Jordan something? Is yeah. That the two Jordan guys? Jordan Feigenbaum, and I don't know Michael's last name. Um, Sorry, Michael. But um, <laughs> very interesting in regards to, like, um, speaking about, like, um, movement like purists saying that like you know the squat has to look a certain way or the deadlift has to look a certain way i think we probably both would agree that um if like if a squat was looking different from rep to yeah. rep like it looks like a squat then it looks like an rdl and then it looks like a good morning yeah. and then it looks like you know a scared like cat like on the for- on uh <laughs> on, October, yeah. on a halloween then we'd probably be like all right we need to like you know we need to make this movement yeah. more like efficient yeah for example mm-hmm. um so, yeah, when it comes to imbalances, uh, I think, like, movement efficiency is really important, and, and that's what stretching can help you help you test, uh, mm-hmm. which is super important. It can, like, static as well as dynamic stretching and, you know, SMR, MR, FR, however you want to say it, uh, self-myofascial release, um, can help uh, test a movement either before or during the, yeah. the movement itself. Yeah, it, it's, just, it's just a protocol and a definition. So, obviously... You know, interpret that because just because it's a definition doesn't mean it's a hundred percent correct. Yeah. Um, also, an, an example would be like bent, bent leg hamstring, single leg pelvic tilts, um, and then what was it gastrocnemius um, flex? 
So if you don't know those, we can add them to the list, but you can probably just Google search it and you'll yeah. probably kind of tell. Pretty much just like a calf yeah. raise, pretty much sticking your butt towards the back of the room yeah. with, with little to no knee bend. And then uh, what was the other one? Um, bent leg hamstring. Okay, that would just be a, or, uh, that would be like one leg sticking your, keep it. Or if you're on the, f- if you're laying on your back. Oh yeah, true. Yeah, you can yeah. just, you can raise your, you can ra- raise your leg up. And, and when you do that, um. You could probably put something on your foot. Yeah. And just kind of pull. The way, um, I've seen that too, is like you want to try to actively, um, keep your non-stretched foot, um. Down Maintain and contact with the ground or as much as possible. And is your, and your butt probably. Yeah. And every, you want, those points of contact kind of like the bench, with the bench, like, you know, make sure you're making those points of contact, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Dynamic. to a certain degree, it gets to like um, like Kama Sutra positions, and you're trying to get into like certain. Like, you're you're looking like a, <laughs> like a random like pretzel looking thing, yeah. and you're like, yeah, I'm just doing a straight leg uh, stretch for my hamstring. You do yoga, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, so my um, definition of dynamic stretching, I pretty much just like made this up on the fly. Uh, I think either this morning or this weekend. Yeah. Um, I try to like try to make things. Uh, at times, um, because I'm definitely like a, I'm a, a perpetrator of making things way overly complicated. Um, but the way I like to think of it is moving a muscle or muscle groups uh, through a range of motion in order to induce a quote unquote warm up effect and to induce increased range of motion through the desired movement pattern. So a um, a dynamic movement that I do almost any any workout before I do my workout are going to be um, some type of a lunge. Um, I really like going through um, a lunge, like a forward lunge or a reverse lunge, and not holding a position, but doing like a walking lunge, like from one side of the gym to the next, just to, to wake up um, the hips, to wake up the knee, the ankle, to test out where like my back is in space. Um, so um, that's a, a good example of a, a dynamic um, warm up that I do almost yeah. every time I'm in the gym. Sweet. Yeah. Do you want me to go over neuromuscular? Yeah, it's a good one. That's actually a really good one to cover. Um, neuromuscular stretching, also known as proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, also abbreviated as PNF. As you can tell, no one wants to say that word <laughs> or words at the same time all the time. Yeah. Um, by NASM, it's used by professionals trained in this ten- technique. Um, it sounds like they're like saying like you might need a certification yeah. uh, or like a doctorate, which yeah. is pretty funny because I don't know if you do. Um, it is done with Doctor assistance. Stretching. Yeah, <laughs> doctor prof- uh, professional stretching. Uh, it is done with assistance of a personal trainer moving a client's body part through a range of motion until first resistance barrier um, of the muscles and joints. So pretty much like kind of if you think of like the straight leg stretch to stretch your hamstring if you're laying on your back um if for some reason like you can't do at least like perpendicular to the floor um you know the trainer will pretty much will hold your like ankle top of your foot to grab like level um they will push you your leg just a little bit further obviously not to the point where you're hurting um and then pretty much you will then try to push force opposite way to kind of uh, make that range of motion a little bit larger next time. Um, it says you want to push against the trainer with a 25% maximal contraction for seven to five seconds. Um, the trainer then moves the body part in a wider range of motion, holding it for 20 and 30. So you would push, hold, and then the trainer will push, uh, give a little bit more further in that range of motion. So your body can get used to it as well as um, adapt and lengthen that range of motion. Um, and it's funny, my brother was going, and this is just a side point, my brother was going through medical training and for to become a doctor of medical school, I mean, not medical training. Um, and they actually teach that in oh, medical cool. school. And like I've learned about it probably before I started like getting to like seriously about learning about personal training and stuff. And he, like, you know, he would, they, they teach you like within like older adults that lost that range of motion or people that has been injured for rehab purposes. Um, so it can help a lot of different, uh, 
modality. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's a lot of different like ways this can help. Um, a lot of people don't ever bring it up, but that's definitely a great like train, uh, sh- sh- you know, a stretching modality. Yeah. So. Yeah, Laura. Sometimes if she's feeling like kind of like tight or like um, you know, if she's had like a long day or something like that, she bikes um, home after work. And she'll ask that, like, I do that stretch for. And, like, another way that you you usually don't see, which I, I've actually found is, like, super helpful, too, um, for testing, like, range of motion in the triceps, actually. Because the triceps are, are kind of a tricky muscle yeah. um, that have three heads. And one of the heads that's not often hit in the overhead tricep stretch is, I think, the long head mm-hmm. of the tricep. So um, it, it could be something that you, like, test out with Sam. But um, the next time that she's like doing a tricep stretch or even you're doing a tricep stretch, um, so you're pulling down on the elbow, have her pull back with as the, well. With the hand, right? With the hand, mm-hmm. yeah. So um, that way you're able to engage like more of the heads of the triceps. <clears throat> How's that like that? Which makes you get the bigger arms. The triceps, <laughs> baby. Well, it's, uh, unloaded stretching. Um, I did actually want to cover this. So unloaded stretching, unless for like you're like severely deconditioned, um, most likely doesn't like result in hypertrophy or gains. No, I know, but I'm just saying like if you can active activate it while doing the yeah. unloaded tra- stretching, maybe during the next exercise or overhead movement, it will activate more. Yeah. So the benefit because it'll keep your it'll keep your head on that point then of the tricep. Yeah. So the benefit might be like for an individual like when it comes to overhead. Yeah. I, I see next to nobody when they're doing an overhead tricep going beyond 90 degrees but why not right like because you here yeah why so can't they go like here i i extend it as much as i can because yeah, well, i want to get as much yeah. elbow flexion as possible when i do so your I favorite can, exercise the french press, french press i go all the way down yeah, i try same. to it's literally until like for some reason my hands can't do hold it anymore but yeah the, look it up the french press for the tricep movement I'm pretty sure that's the the right term, yeah. unless I made it up. But it, let me know if you need it. It's like a, if you're seating, sitting down, you're just pretty much putting your hands on the dumbbell and your tricep extending it. But Roman's talking about if a lot of, he sees a lot of people not pulling it down all the way before uh, extending the arms. So that's a good point. Even games on the table, yeah. really quick because we probably need to wrap up soon. Uh, practical applications for stretching. Yeah. Why stretch? When do you utilize stretching? Oh, yeah. That, well, we're going to go over that, too. Like, what's... Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, uh, practical applications. Uh, static stretching is probably not best as a warm-up. It's probably best as a part of a cool-down. As you and, saw me. Trying to not explain it during static stretching, but yeah. since I took that definition, I was, like, trying not to say anything. But. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> And dynamic stretching would be more of something that you utilize as part of your warm up. So it can, it can as close as possible mimic the movement. So you could just do air squats before you squat. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, we see people like go to the gym and like pretty strong people too that you'd expect to like know better. And they'll do a know, quad stretch and then go right to squats. Like three fifteen on, on the bar. Um, well, I also have seen someone squat one eighty five without even doing anything. Yeah. Like first set. Yeah. And I, t- I, t- I text you about it. It's like, sometimes it's scary. Yeah. Um, but um, to your point, yeah, I mean, since I'm, I, I think I alluded it to it in previous podcasts, since I'm doing full body uh, workouts, I don't do upper lower anymore. So before I, before I work out, just real quickly, like my protocol, I go usually five to 10 minutes walking on the treadmill. It depends if I'm not walking already, because sometimes like I walk to the gym, so there's no point in me going on the treadmill again. But before I go into any exercise, since I'm doing usually legs, something with lower back or like upper body, like I will grab a rope, I'll do movements with no weight, I'll do body movements, I'll do like lunges like Roman would say um, to get ready for my legs, but I'll do all those movements because with full body, you can't just jump in to squats to, you know, cable rows or deadlifts to like, you know, um, dumbbell flap dumbbell press yeah you, you you need to go through some movements to get your body ready um, do you want me to go over like that warm-up thing real quick yeah let's do it I okay. like what you said there too um, because I think a proper warm-up protocol needs to be general in nature meaning we're trying to warm up the whole body yeah. so you have your your walk yeah even mm-hmm. if you don't do full body I yeah. think that's I think what you're trying to say too is like you could do you should probably do this too because 
this you use your upper body when you're squatting yeah and then you move more into the specific yeah. so maybe you want to do some sort of like cable like face pull where you're you're warming up the rhomboids where you're warming up the lats maybe yeah. you want to do some air squats some lunges yeah that's great so um before we started this episode we wanted to make sure everyone like that's what that's what why roman was going over like the warm-up we wanted to make this stretching and the warm-up but make sure like just so you know like they coincide but they're different because like warming up is not doing all the stretching before you lift you don't want to sit there do static dynamic active isolated and neuromuscular stretching before you lift like First off, you'd probably be there for, like, three, four hours. <laughs> yeah. And second off, like, what Roman was saying about, like, static stretching, like, you probably shouldn't do that beforehand. So, like, simply, like, warming up, that's what we do. Um, before I get into why you need to warm up, like, a quick, like, you know, definition and why you do that, do, like, the static, in my opinion, I think the static stretching is good at home, like, before you go to bed or before you wake up. Because before you wake up, get your body ready, get it warm, so you move. A lot of people get it wrong. They'll just jump out of bed and just start moving right away. I just say, like, hey, save the static stretching at home. Because if you do have imbalances, stretch your, you know, do those long stretches at home while you're watching TV. Make it nice and easy. I do it literally before bed, and we're watching TV before bed. And then you go go to sleep. Um, But the warm-up really quickly... Um, pretty much what Roman was saying too is without saying it is um, warming up is you want to raise the core t- uh, temperature in the temperature of muscles um, you don't it's like stretching a rubber band you never if you ever stretch a cold rubber band you will rip it probably instantly um, or a tight rubber uh, well not a tight a cold rubber band let's just say that so pretty much the muscles they want to be warm um, there is an example that I found with like visco properties within the muscle um if you think of pouring cold honey out of a bottle um or cold maple syrup uh, versus hot honey like if you've microwaved honey um, you'll be able to pour that out simply if you don't so that's kind of an example to like your muscles to think of your muscles like that um to help provide um, the enzymes that you need to produce um, energy within the temperature and producing ATP. Um, so that's pretty much what I want to sum up with the stretching piece with the warm up um, to make it nice and simple because we probably don't need to do, like you were saying earlier, don't need a whole thing about warm ups. Yeah. Anything else you want to add? I think that's it, folks. Dang. Episode 15, closing out. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe. Tell your moms, tell your dads, tell your coworkers. Tell your sisters, your brothers, their mothers, your friends, your co-workers, mothers and fathers, their brothers and sisters, anybody. Just blast it on social media. Please, please help us out. Um, Make sure to stay tuned with the Instagram so you're always updated with the latest. Our YouTube channels, our Instagrams, my Twitter, the Facebook page, whatever it is. Um, But thank you for watching, guys. We'll see you on the next one. Peace.